Hi. Hi. Hello. Sorry, I'm a minute late. I was waiting at the wrong link. <laughs> oh, oh, gosh. Oh, God. It's that. our worst nightmare. We do it to each other. And she's, I'm like texting her, I'm here. She's like, no, you're not. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, yes, I was I feeling... Am. I was feeling so good about myself because I joined it at like 7.59 and I was like, I'm on time. But nope, I was just waiting for someone else's meeting. <laughs> That's so funny. And we were saying you were remarkably prompt last time. And we had to go in the morning. So yes. Like, we're like, is something wrong? Because she's very <laughs> tiny. Oh my gosh. Like, like Emily. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just got lucky last time is what yeah. it is. This time, unfortunately, is more of the norm for me. Your I true try self. not to do it. But yeah, I, it's the worst. It's the worst, especially when it's like virtual. I feel like, I don't know. It's like, it, yeah. I always think, oh, I'll just be able to join right at the time of, and then something goes wrong. So oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Exactly. You're, you're preaching to the choir here you probably do as much of these more more in clusters than we do so yeah maybe always... in clusters definitely yes. not overall yeah. more than you do for sure not that that's true <laughs> well that's just true. to, to uh, reintroduce ourselves I'm Corinne yeah, and I'm hi. Kate hello nice to hey. see you again Same. yes we are so excited we're just just Aww. beyond excited yeah. so. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. so we wore I... our pink not the right pink, though. Either well, one of us, but we and tried. And I did not. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like a failure. <laughs> no. Well, you're matching beach read. You're, I mean, people we meet on vacation. We're mat you're matching yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got some. Yeah, <laughs> some complimentary yes. colors going on. Yeah. Yeah. Also, you're Emily Henry. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's so not I possible. Just... <laughs> oh. Well, thank um, you. Yes. All right. So we're gonna. I'll be you want to take a picture? Get into some questions. Let's oh, take yeah. a picture. Yeah. Yes. We Should started. I grab one too? We, we do have, Why not? Oh, Why yes. Not? <laughs> okay, okay, we're going to. Kate, wait. Gonna, oh, oh, do you want me? I'm okay, going to do I'll it. I'll do the first one. I'll do the first one. Okay. Oh, yeah, or I can do it. No, 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 no. Don't. <laughs> you don't have to. Oh, my God. All right. Here we go. Perfect. All right. That's good. I think okay. that's great. Okay. Perfect. Oh my God, you're like, you're the best guest, aren't you? You like are like, what can I bring? Did I? Bring oh my God, not enough. Yes, but then I am three minutes late to everything, yeah. so there's that. It kind of, it kind of even. Three out. is it nothing. Is that is nothing. All right, all right. Let's we'll get started. On this episode of Complicated Conversations, we welcome back New York Times best-selling author Emily Henry. Emily is the author of Beach Read, People We Meet on Vacation, Book Lovers, A Million Junes, The Love That Split the World, and of course I've got here co-author of Hello Girls. Uh, her new novel, Happy Place, debuted at number one on both the print hardcover and the combined print ebook list of the New York Times bestseller. You'd think I had anything to do with it. I'm so excited <laughs> for you. I think you might have. Nothing. No. Listen. Congratulations, Emily, and welcome back to Pop Fiction Women. Thank you so much, Corinne. I'm really happy to be talking to you both again. Uh, so can you tell, before we get into this book, and we have so much to talk about with, with Harriet and Wynne, but tell us what that moment was like. I, I, of, of finding out you were number one instantly because um, we've seen you we're both f big fans of your social media um, pre-publication kind of really busting your butt right getting yeah. the word out talking and it's so organic from oh. from this side you're just talking to people and excited about your book and excited about the next process because you are kind of asking readers to go on a, a little bit of a new journey with you with this book yeah right one yeah is kind of the logistics yeah, of the hardcover, and then also an ensemble that is a little bit more, uh, expands the romance genre. So tell us about that moment when you, when you knew we were all along for the ride. I mean, uh, I will admit I knew that people were largely along for the ride because my editor was checking in with numbers. And so I was really relieved because obviously when they come to an author and tell them like, we're moving you into hardcover, that is your first thought. You're like, Oh no, no one's going to read this right. one. Um, so I was nervous about that. And like you said, it's also a bit different of a book and I don't read my own reviews except for sometimes the five star ones. But I knew that in some ways it was becoming a divisive book with early copies just because some people wanted more romance and, some people were really excited about the ensemble cast. So 
it, I, I kind of knew things were going how they were going and that readers were on board to an extent, but then my publishing team wanted to just schedule a call for around the time that the list drops. And there's this thing in publishing where we're all kind of superstitious, especially about the list. Like Mm -hmm. before Beach Read came out, the possibility of hitting the list was never even mentioned. And then the day that it came out, I was thinking, is this possible? Should I be bracing for this? And I texted my editor and later I found out that she was kind of freaking out that I texted her because she was like, no, we weren't going to mention it. Talk like- <laughs> yes. Oh, um, this is like a no hitter in baseball. You just, you don't, yeah. you don't mention it. You, yeah. you know, jinx it. Exactly. So she scheduled this team meeting for around the same time, but it was called like super casual Wednesday <laughs> hangout, even though it was like my, my, At my least. team. And then it was also like the director of like marketing and the, or of publicity and like the you know the Super publisher casual. yeah like we're all just hanging out <laughs> everyone's at invited on zoom yeah so we were just oh kind of gosh. catching up and talking and then um suddenly i saw one of my my colleagues just kind of go and i didn't know if that was a good face or a bad face so um <laughs> And then she told me and she started with um, the hardcover list, but then she didn't like say anything else after that. And obviously we are all sort of like, what if, what if crossing our fingers for the other Mm -hmm. one? So um, Mm -hmm. I also immediately just had this like sinking, like, which is so stupid because hitting any list is amazing, but I really wanted to be on the combined list too. So I was just kind of like, Oh, she's not saying it because, but she was just scrolling. (laughs) She was just scrolling. So then we got to that and yeah, it was, um, pretty amazing and i think the 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 most amazing piece of it was the audiobook list because that is monthly and what that means is oh. basically that the audiobook oh. sold well enough to hit number 7 just in the few days that the book was out which i think is a huge testament to the fact that <sighs> julia whalen also wow. is like uh, yeah, yeah just yes. a leviathan yeah uh, yeah yes. Yes. like she is incredible I, li- I will listen to anything she reads i've told corinne the only drawback is now every book to me if it's not read by julia whalen i'm just like what is who are you and what is Same. like I, I expect to hear her voice in my ears so i know yeah and but she that's makes incredible. all of the dialogue funnier she makes all of the emotions mm-hmm. more potent it's like exactly who you would hope would be reading your books like for mm-hmm. sure and also it's like i love her taste and she's at the point where she can kind of just choose which books she wants to do and so it is yeah. a pretty reasonable bet if I look up like Julia Whalen audio audiobooks I'm gonna enjoy the books not like just because book. of her narration yes, but like the right. book itself yes yeah yes. yeah oh absolutely wow what yeah. a moment Jeez. Yeah. well tell us about the book tell our listeners happy about place. the the happy place and and what inspired you sure so happy place the like elevator pitch is that it's about Harriet and Wynne, who've been a couple since they got together in college about eight years ago. And part of their relationship is every summer they go with their best friends to this family cottage on the coast of Maine and have the most magical time outside of reality and work and all of that. And this year's trip is going to be a little bit different because Harriet and Wynne have secretly broken up and she is going to go on the trip alone. They found an excuse to get him out of it. She's going to go and break the news only when she shows up She finds out that her friend's family is selling the cottage and this will be their last week ever. And it's very emotional and very intense. And so Harriet and Wynne decide, okay, we are kind of backed into a corner here. We don't want to ruin their magical last week. We'll let them think we're still together for just a few more days. And then we'll go home or go our separate ways and wait a few days and then be like, hey, we decided to break up, <laughs> even yeah. though they've been totally not speaking for five months. So yes. um, that was that's the basic premise. And it actually started with, um, well, a couple different points. But one was I just thought the idea of having to pretend to be get together specifically on a trip with all other couples was innately funny, whether it was um, two people who just wanted to score an invitation to a couple's trip mm-hmm. that they're never <laughs> included on, yeah. or, you know, a former couple who like has to pretend to still be a couple. And so the second point that kind of pushed me in that direction was I was watching a lot of the 1940s comedy of remarriage screwball films. And Mm. I thought those were so fun and so ridiculous. And I wanted to try my hand at it. But what always happens is I take a trope that I think is really fun and usually happens in sort of a heightened reality. And then when I 
overlay kind of my worldview and my writing style on top of that, it ends up feeling very different. And so yeah. even though it's yeah. fake dating in this ostensibly screwball scenario, it's like, well, they were a couple for eight years. I, I'm not going to be able to make it just like funny that they broke right. up yes. or funny right. that they're sharing a room now. So there is definitely a lot of humor permeating it, but it also... Um, you know, has sort of a melancholy vibe in a lot of ways because it's the end of an era. And also because I just really wanted to buy into the fact that these two people have been intimately involved with each other's lives for like a decade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You really set up, set up that melancholy note from the start with, like you said, that they are selling the cottage. So of course there's going to be nostalgia and also like what's next and what are we doing? And so uh, you set us up right from the start to know that there there'll be that threaded through. But then also it's an Emily Henry book, so you know there's going to be good romance and fun too. But uh, that, well, thank I you that piece, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean there were definitely a couple of later drafts that were entirely for me about adding jokes, <laughs> being like I want this. To, like honestly, the book is way less overtly sad than it started out. I am relieved to say um, it still has the melancholy feeling, but I mean everybody's going to hate me for this, but it was kind of what I was like thinking about wrestling with. Um, there was a dog who died, <laughs> not through traumatic, oh, not through right, tra right. traumatic means, but an old, old right. dog who was like supposed to be representative of their relationship. And my editor was like, honey, <laughs> can we, can we just are, not kill the yeah, dog? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, fair enough. Fair oh. enough. There's too much oh. going on. Um, and the dog oh, came out, and and he is still happily living in cut pages. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh well, I'm kind of glad actually. I'm oh, with your too. editor. <laughs> me too. I mean, I yeah. I kept telling her like I chose this scenario because I thought it would be so fun, and why can't why am I just keying into the most gut wrenching version of it? And she was like, "Well, let me help you out. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have a." a pet die yeah. <laughs> like oh and it's so funny because I always tell her it's like she just I, I, my books truly would not be what they are without her I know that there are some people who are very lightly edited and and maybe are more kind of like in a vacuum but my I mean if you love Emily Henry books it's partly because you love my editors Amanda Bergeron and Sarir Cotter um which I might be saying Sarir's last name less wrong Sarir Cotter anyway um I, I love that you said smart. that yeah, I love yeah. that you said that, one, because you share that team with Carly Fortune. But we're yes. big fans of, of mm -hmm. Yes, so um, good. And then also because I have a book coming out next year, and I have an editorial letter that is this thick. Single, yes. <laughs> single Terrifying. Space. Yeah, but but I, I will have to say the same. I'll have to remember to say the same thing next year. If you love this book, it is because it is yes. a Natalie Halleck book. It yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. It's so I real. I mean, in the, when we were talking about Julia, that's the same thing as like yes. with Amanda. It's like any time she, I, I see that she's posted a book on release day, and I then I know that it's one of hers. I'm like, well, I want to read that because she edits a really wide range, but I have yet to read anything of hers that I don't totally love. Mm -hmm. And like you said, she's got Carly Fortune, she's got um, Dolan Perkins Valdez, oh, um, yes. Ashley Poston. Um, oh, oh, yeah, I and. Met her. Oh, yeah, she, also yeah. lovely and wonderful, yes. and yeah, yes. Amanda yes. is fan. And she and she was Sally Thorne's first editor before oh, wow. um, she moved publishers. So yeah, yeah. So she's yeah. like, wow. you can trust the Amanda stamp. I would yes. say, love nice. that, love that. Well, let's talk about Harriet. Um, I read an article in which you said that every time you put a book out, you have a fear about how your heroine is going to be received. And that you realized it's because you put these little parts of yourself into these characters. So really you're afraid of how people will see you, which I thought yes. was so interesting. Yeah. So, but then you realize, which we all do when we read them, that ultimately we always relate to these women. I think I told you last time with book lovers that like you went into my brain to write <laughs> Nora. So, um, but tell us about your development of Harriet or Harry and which little part of yourself you put in her that you're worried maybe people may reject. I mean, I wouldn't even call it a little part because I think what it is so <laughs> often is I take something that feels really huge in me and then I build a character around that. And it's kind of weird because all of these women look very different in the way that they perceive things and, and 
um, interact with the world. But I think in real life, people are so much more contradictory and you like kind of can't build your characters that way because it's just too confusing. But when you're building a character, it's like you take that one thing and you're like, that's, that's her thing. And so for Harriet it's the people pleasing. And it's kind of funny Mm -hmm. that I didn't realize this thing about myself and my writing and publishing process until I had a book that was about a people pleaser. And so um, I think I kind of touched on this in the article you're talking about, but it was like with January, I was like, everybody's going to think she's way too emotional and she cries too much. And then with Poppy, it was like, they're going to think she's so annoying and that she's, you know, jokes at inappropriate times and that she, why can't she just take things seriously and be open to serious conversations? And with Nora, I was like, they're going to think she's like a bitch. <laughs> and then with Harriet, mm-hmm. it was sort of like, the absence of any of that. It's like, they're going to think she's too wishy-washy and she doesn't have like take enough um, control in her life or have any agency. And it's so funny because all of those things look kind of disparate and like, they're not the same woman, but they are. And I think that that's just kind of a testament to the fact that it feels like there's very narrow constraints around what an ideal woman would be. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> every, it's like every single Uh, facet of your personality is on like a slider and you're trying to find that magic you know setting where you're like that's yeah you're like this is where I'm supposed to be and everyone will like this and I'll be palatable and loved (laughs) if I do this Mm -hmm. and so it's like funny but not too loud and like confident but not a bitch and um, in touch with your emotions but not emotional and and pleasant to be around but not spineless it's like it's impossible I mean it's it really is impossible and and you know, I think everybody likes to say that your like thirties and forties are just about not caring, <laughs> like not caring, but I have not gotten to that point of not caring yet. So that yeah. was Harriet. Harriet was my attempt to get closer to not caring. Well, I'll yeah. tell you, I'm not sure that I, I, I'm not there either, but this book really made me realize where I still hold on to it the most. Like I yeah. have let go of it so much with, with friends because I have a great group of friends who accept me and yeah. I, uh, in my, in my marriage, but, and, and outside, you know, strangers certainly let go of that first, but at work, it's the hardest place for me to let go of it. I am just so terrified of disappointing people at work yeah. and it's just a part of me that I can't let go of. And, and it's funny because mm. you're also saying like, I was, I could be such a bitch and <laughs> lash out to, to the other side right. at work but not to like my superiors. Then I was like the people pleaser yeah. always. Mm-hmm. So yeah. like, it's so complicated. You're right. And you're constantly adjusting those settings. Like where can I vent? Where can I not vent? Where can I be myself? And it's, yeah, yeah it's a, it's, it's a, it's so yeah. interesting. Cause it's like, that says so much to, I mean, <laughs> not to psychoanalyze, but my mm-hmm. first thought is like, what is your relationship to authority? That that's how oh, you yeah. feel. Because for me, it's so much more with the people that I am super close to that I'm just terrified of, of letting them down, but also feel like I'm constantly letting them down. And I'm like, okay, what does this say about me? The, oh. the people I'm closest to, I'm like, you're going to get sick of me at some point, or I'm going to fail you too yeah. hard. Oh, Emily, yeah. I'll raise you on that psychoanalysis <laughs> because I used to work uh, in finance uh, as a lawyer and all of my men, uh, all of my bosses were yeah. men. And I yes. had no problem challenging their authority for me. It was just a wow. different thing. It's yeah. maybe because I was closer to my father and I, we had an easy dynamic. Now yeah. that I'm in publishing and I have an editor who's, and an agent who are both women, I'm so much more terrified. Hi, yeah. mommy issues. Mommy yes. issues. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can completely and, see that. Yes. That is so interesting. And uh-huh. also the funny thing, I, I mean, I can't speak to your specific agent and editor, but a funny thing about publishing which of course is like a woman dominated field overall is that almost everyone is also so nice. And actually that can yes. be oh. kind of the thing that's scarier oh, yeah, where it's that's... like, you feel like a bull in yeah. a China shop. Cause you're like, everyone's so nice. Am I like a monster? <laughs> like, yes. oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm so like, no, like and blunt coming... in a way compared to that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And coming from, we're both lawyers and have been in big law firms working for men. And now that this makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Cause Corinne, I can see what you're saying. You can be a certain way with these men and just in that environment, even if it's not men, but 
I, I wouldn't know what to do in a nice environment. What oh are you talking about? Yeah. I would have no idea what to do and with nice I'm people. I'm having tr- trouble. I, I'm not in that realm of being so nice. Like, to your point, Emily, about the bowl in yeah. the china shop. I'm like, I'm not so nice. Sometimes I'm blunt and sometimes yes. I'm like really laying it out on the table. And oh God, does everyone hate me now even yeah. more? Well, yeah. and it's like, oh, it's so funny God. because I always think about the difference between being like kind and sweet. And I would say I'm a kind person, but I would not say I'm a sweet person. I think people are surprised by that right. because I'm like blonde <laughs> and wear bright colors. Yeah. But I think, you know, I, I think yeah. I'm very kind and emotionally generous and just generous in my life. But I also think that I can be kind of jarring to people who don't know me because yeah, I, I, you know, I was the youngest yeah. of only, only had older brothers. And I think it was, you know, I have like the ultimate little sister complex where I'm just like, oh I'm allowed gosh. to be here. <laughs> just yeah. boss. That is little. me. Yeah. Yes. I, yeah, I, I, kn- I knew we were both Leos. I didn't know we were yes. both the youngest and the only girl. That is a whole other layer right there. Yeah. I love that we have like, I think the most stereotypical Leo hair that you can possibly have. Like, 100%. When I see someone with like just- blonde hair I'm like you better be a Leo because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> if not you need to change yes, that, that hair yeah. Yes. Yeah. oh my god uh, all right well anyway. uh, let's get off the couch for a minute and talk about <laughs> back to the book place. yes I want to talk about the narrative because it's split into present day Harriet's real life at Sabrina's summer house uh, on the coast of Maine as we've already discussed and and then also chapters where Harriet is going to her happy place and these are moments in the past in places like uh, the cottage and also Mattingly, Vermont and Morningside Heights, New York City. And as she investigates the past, the narrative goes to Harriet's dark place, too. We won't talk too much about that. But tell me how you knew you had to tell this story this way. And also when, like how? Oh, my gosh. So late. (laughs) So late. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So it was just a mess of flashbacks for a long, for many drafts. It was a mess of flashbacks and that's always so tricky to, to keep straight. And, you know, you want the, when you're using flashbacks, it's like you want it to feel seamless and like it's happening in the right place, but you also want it to feel distinct and separate from the, you know, kind of a story so that it's clear to the reader what's going on. And also when you're using so many flashbacks, it's so confusing because I feel like you kind of need to have them in chronological order for the reader to ha- go along the, you know, smoothest journey. Yeah. And that wasn't necessarily happening the way that I was using the flashbacks. And um, the title of the book was originally a different title. It was called, while I was drafting, it was called Couples Trip. And mm. there were a lot of questions about whether that seems like maybe it was suggesting swingers. And <laughs> we didn't oh, think that it was like yeah. fun enough. And we also have... Um, this kind of plan plan i don't know so amanda bergeron my editor and i um have one thing we've really enjoyed about working on these books together is with every title where we talk about having like a winky element Mm -hmm. and that's the thing that i think some readers are like baffled (laughs) by the titles and then the readers who get it are like oh that's what that title specifically means and and they buy into it Mm -hmm. like beach read i i feel like it's like you know it's about a woman trying to write a beach read. And then it's also about what makes a beach read. Like that's mm-hmm. the question of the book. Um, and with people we meet on vacation, it's like, uh, you know, the people that she's meeting are mostly actually just all these different versions of herself and uh, of Alex, her best friend. So for this one, couples trip had no winky element. It was just sort of the, the concept. And when we started brainstorming titles that we thought would be more inviting and warm, but also, um, have that have kind of layer. winky yeah. thing yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, like one of the very first if not the very first title that I pitched was happy place but we were overthinking everything and we we're like does that sound like a thriller because it definitely <laughs> could be with the right cover <laughs> and so yes. we we just went down such a long deep rabbit warren <laughs> and then we yeah. rabbit warren and then we came back and um ended up Show, showing a list of titles to the wider team. And they were like, yeah, happy place, obviously. So once that was settled, or even when I pitched it, I thought, oh my God, this is the answer. I can yeah. structure this book around Harriet's various happy places. Happy places. And it just totally made sense because obviously, you know, the concept is like this book takes place in their happy place overall. But then there's also all of these moments that she finds herself going back to whenever she's not doing so hot and a big part of the book 
is the idea that so many of us have these sort of happy places that are far outside of our daily lives. And with the last few years of everybody's life shrinking mm -hmm. so much, that became so apparent. If you didn't actually like your daily life, it was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's why there were like so many, um, so many pandemic divorces, so many pandemic moves, so many pandemic job changes, people just being like, oh no, this is all I have suddenly. And it's not, and now I have to no. face that this isn't necessarily what I want. So um, interestingly, I have read one review of the book, like a trade review that was kind of like, it was very positive, but it was like, this is strange because it's such a pandemic book, but it's not at all about the pandemic. The pandemic is never mentioned. Mm -hmm. But I think that was the case. And, and the concept of the happy place for me was like so much about where are you escaping to? And, mm -hmm. you know, why is that not more of a part of your daily life? If you're not, if, 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 if you're kind of living for the weekend, if you're like muscling yeah. through 51 weeks of the year to get to this one week, <laughs> then maybe right. you should kind of think about making some changes <laughs> mm -hmm. in, the, yeah. in the, the other 51 weeks. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So let's go to Win. We have to get to Win. So Win and, and Harriet, as you said, have been dating since college. They were engaged for years. He refers to himself, which I love, as slow release boring. Not to be confused with her who's slow release hot, which I also yeah. <laughs> totally relate to. But yes. um, so slow release boring because he thinks the more you get to know him, the less interesting he is. He's very self-deprecating, quick to note that he's not smart or not as smart as her, not as accomplished, very laid back. But at some point, you know, he, he actually thinks he'll bring Harry down and he yeah. never wants to do that because he loves her. Um, and in fact, loving her is sort of the one thing he's good at. You know, it's what comes naturally to him. And I love that. Um, but what I realized is in my romance novels, I've realized that what I love is when the male character has his own arc and growth and yeah. You know, yeah. that you come to see that they also have to reflect and grow and do their own work. So, which we have here with Wynn. So tell us about your development of Wynn and sort of his arc. Oh my gosh. Again, this, so ev almost everything that works in this book was unfortunately the product of much, much, much editing and rewriting. There were very few things that when I wrote the first draft clicked and were right. Um, this, it was a book that I felt like I had to fight for every second of every day. And when, like, I felt like I knew his spirit from the very beginning. I felt like I knew, you know, just like who he really was at his core. But as far as his arc, that happened very gradually. Like the kind of thing where it's like, I didn't even totally see the moment that it all clicked. But it was probably, and I, I won't, you know, give spoilers, but I think when you get to sort of, the conversation surrounding why they actually broke up and then mm -hmm. what's happened in the months since then, that was when I really, you know, like that kind of just happened. That kind of just came out. It wasn't an intentional, Oh, we need to give him an arc. It was like, I just need to understand this character. I need to believe mm -hmm. that why they broke up and I need to believe that there's a chance that they could make it work now. And it was, um, I think a really, when I got to that, to that scene, to, to understanding what really ended their relationship the first time, it felt so um, real to me. And, you know, I haven't been in that exact situation, but for, it feels like I have lived that situation because I think, mm -hmm. you know, like there's so much, I'm trying to like talk around this where yeah, I'm like, not, yeah. <laughs> not spoiling it. Yeah. But, you know, there's there's the thing in romance readership about how we all hate like the miscommunication trope. And I think that gets used very widely at this point. But my belief is that it started out as a way to describe that situation where a couple have fallen in love and then one of them like overhears part of a conversation and is like takes it at face value and it's very damning information. And then she storms off and he's like, wait, let me explain. And she's like, no, no, I heard enough. <laughs> and then, you know, they go their separate ways. And then later she realizes, no, you thought you heard this, but this is what you really heard. I think that is the true miscommunication trope. It's a very easy way of being like, you know, this thing broke yeah. them up, but it has almost no basis in, Reality, And I knew that because Wynne and Harriet are avoiding a lot of important conversations, some readers would not be able to handle that and they would think of that as miscommunication. But I think 
I don't think of it as miscommunication. I think of it as, first of all, there's some lying going on. There's some like active um, <clears throat> deceiving, not in a cruel way, just, you know, they're not being honest about their feelings and what's happening, which definitely happens in real life. And I believe Protecting. the character's motivations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the added layer of, I feel like I can talk about this because I don't think this is a spoiler, but there's the added layer of mental illness involved. Like yeah. when you, ha the, people love to say like depression lies. And like when mm. you're depressed, you don't even really know what that means. You're like, I don't have mm. any concept of what you're talking about. I, I think that you, you might even assume it's just the idea that it'll never get better. And you're like, well, that, yeah, okay, whatever. That's what people mean when they say depression lies. But it's so much deeper and more insidious than that because it really contorts every little detail of your life and you're so sure that you're looking at things the right way the real way the only true way and when people try and you know convince you to consider therapy or medicine or whatever you're like well that wouldn't help because this is my life like my life is not going to change based on any of those things and it's just impossible when you're in that dark place to believe that something like therapy or medicine could suddenly just make everything look so different, different. without yeah. anything mm -hmm. actually changing. And yeah. I've seen that time and again in my life, in the lives of people I'm close to, when they finally get the help that they need. And it's like, w this is so weird. Like, it's so weird. Like nothing changed. And suddenly it's like, I, I understand that I like can't even work myself back into that logic that I yeah. had before mm -hmm. of why things mm -hmm. were, were so bad. And, um, and so some of that is like Harriet and Wynne are dealing with their own like mental health yes. issues and their mm -hmm. views of how things, um, are, are like very warped. Yeah. 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 And it also lies about the trajectory. This it's certain about the trajectory of yes. life. It is. I know yes. X, Y, and Z has happened therefore or A, B, C, then D, E, F has to happen. There's no right. other possible way. And that is just not true. Um, and right. That, That's such that a good can, point. Yeah. Yeah. That can be changing perspective too. Um, so I want to talk about the trope of, of this couple because they're faking it, but they are really in love with each other. I mean, there's right. no <laughs> doubt about that. These, they mm -hmm. have a, a great relationship or have had a strong bond. Um, but yet they are faking it for their friends and they're, and it's not working right now uh, where mm -hmm. they are. And so how did you decide to make that their issue, their core issue, that, the, that these were questions of like, what if it's, I love you, but it's not enough and that's not going to yeah. work. And, and, and what, where were you, what were you going, uh, developing there? I think partly it was just logistical because I knew from the beginning that, like I said, I needed to really believe that they loved each other, really believe in the reason that they broke up and understand it. And then really believe in the possibility of them making it work. And that's really hard to find a, again, like a more lighthearted way in. Yeah like you think about the reasons couples who really love each other split up. And a lot of times it's grief at the core of it. It's like, I, you know, I love you, but this thing has plunged me into this hole and I'm alone in here. And yeah. like, I, no matter what, I can't reach you kind of thing. So, um, like I said, I didn't really know what the cause of the end of their relationship was until I wrote toward it and and saw little pieces come together and i knew from you know i knew from the beginning that i didn't really want to um have either of them have an affair um because i knew that would be just very 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 hard to write and get the reader um on board on so board. i knew that wasn't going to be mm -hmm. the case and um even if it's just sort of logistical stuff keeping them apart like they're you know they're kind of in a long distance relationship which is not really a spoiler she's finishing her residency in San Francisco and he is caring for his ailing mother in uh, Montana so there's like a lot just a lot of little factors at play because I wanted I didn't want them to be blameless mm. but I didn't want them to have been cruel to each other or or careless with each other yeah or mm. one big thing because that's actually the way it usually is it's yes. usually yeah. these little <clears throat> hurts that build yeah. up um and and mm -hmm. instead of just one big thing to blame it on. right yeah I love that it's more true to life that's yeah. for sure yeah um 
Another thing that I think is very true to life that is a through line with really all of the characters is the way their relationships are affected by the programming they've received from their own mm. upbringing. This is where we get a little bit back on the couch <laughs> yeah. um, because a lot of the parental relationships that each of them have experienced, their parents' marriages have really affected the way they are in relationships, which again, is true to life. It is the first relationship we all see and observe. It's our first model. Um, so we love to play armchair psychologists on this podcast. We've already done it today. Um, so for us, it was really refreshing and relatable to kind of see this damage explored because we all live it. So why was that something you wanted to sort of dig deep into? Every single book, I end up there, you know, because I, I think... <laughs> It's so hard. Again, it's it's like my books for me as a writer are often just me tr like working really hard to understand the characters. And then the, the story is what comes out of that. It's like, I want to know who this person is. I want to know what their deepest hurt is. And I want to know how it's being mirrored now and what they're going to do to overcome it or, you know, make progress at least. And every time I'm writing a love story, when I'm trying to think of like what is holding them back from having the love that they really want, mm -hmm. It's almost always themselves like and I, I know in real life that's not the only thing that holds you back from finding love like being on apps I know for my friends is horrible hellish like I'm not blaming anyone who can't find a love that they want like you know but when you're in a relationship with someone you do love who do does love you a lot of the friction a lot of the miscommunication a lot of the struggles will come from both of your unique triggers and history and uh, coping mechanisms. And I yes. think with every book, so much of what I'm dealing with is specifically taking this character's coping mechanism and showing how it doesn't work anymore. And so for Harriet, that is the people pleasing. It's like she learned very young from her parents tumultuous relationship in life that she could make things smooth and easy and pleasant by being smooth and easy and pleasant and just kind of like, being whatever her parents needed her to be to to maintain her sense of peace in her home and she's carried that forward with her in all of her relationships but people pleasing in relationships it sounds like it would work <laughs> but it doesn't really work it, it 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 will backfire eventually like most coping mechanisms they're good for the time being they get you through those vulnerable childhood years and then you have to learn a healthier way of dealing with things once you are an adult with like Full use of your logic and brain. <laughs> yes, your fully formed brain. Yes. Yes. Well, related to that, one of the specific things that Harriet needs rewiring on is how to fight um, yeah. and to engage mm -hmm. in conflict. And when, and the consequence being that if you don't, it looks like you don't care. It looks like yeah. empathy mm -hmm. or indifference. Um, Kate and I talk all the time about how I think the opposite of love is indifference and yeah. and how also how intimate fighting can be. We were just watching Beef on Netflix. I don't know if you've seen it. It's Not so yet, good. but I've yeah, but, seen the trailer. The, yeah, these two strangers <clears throat> really are fighting and you're like, God, this is so intimate. They're sharing yeah. so much intimacy, even though they're complete strangers. But um, but but I so I've oh, and I also um I was just rewatching 10 things I hate about you. The, the, the line between love and hate for me is a big thing. <laughs> this is something Harriet just is so, it, it, it's so foreign to her. It's not something she understands. So I wanted to talk about Harriet's arc in that way. Is, is that also part of her people pleasing for you? I think that it is. I definitely think that it is, but I also think it's another facet of her childhood where it was, she was watching her parents disagree about things. And instead of continuing a fight or getting to a resolution, they would just kind of, you know, have that initial moment and then just separate and separate and go their own ways and nothing would ever get worked through. And the house would feel tenser after the fact and worse. Mm. And so it was like for her disagreements and fighting meant a lack of intimacy specifically. It meant like, that's the moment that the person will pull away from you mm -hmm. and you won't have that closeness anymore. Whereas when comes from um, a family with two parents who are very much in love and I feel very lucky to be the product of two people who are <laughs> very much in love and growing up, 
it's kind of like a joke with my whole family about like we would go on these family road trips and my parents <laughs> would um we they would wake us up at like three in the morning because the best way to save money on a vacation would be you drive down at three in the morning you get there yeah, you have a full yeah. day where you didn't pay for a motel the exactly. night before and so they would like wake us up at three in the morning pile us in the car everybody would be just kind of like running around my brothers and I would be like nearly asleep everybody's so grumpy my parents are bickering and fighting the the like first 15 minutes of your day are like absolutely nightmarish they're like just you know just on each other just squabbling and then we get into the the van and we pull away from the neighborhood and they both got their thermoses of coffee and then my dad would just like sigh out of relief mm-hmm. and he would just be like i'm sorry honey and like reach over and and grab my mom's hand and then he would be like you guys your mom is so great <laughs> and we would all just oh. be like in the back seat oh. like we don't care let us go to sleep yeah. Yeah. um <laughs> But I saw that, like, from a young age, I saw that fighting was not something yeah. to be afraid of. It was, like, annoying. It would really annoy my brothers and, and me, but it wasn't, it never felt like a threat. And they were never yeah. mean to mm-hmm. each other. They would be snippy yeah. and grumpy, yes. but they were never insulting each other. They were never calling each yeah, other names. Yes. Um, so I luckily had fighting modeled to me very, very well. And it's something yeah, I have yeah. always been pretty good at in romantic relationships whereas my partner had like a parent who would blow up and then everybody would kind of like yeah Yeah. separate and try and wait wait it out (laughs) yeah and so he Mm -hmm. like he says all the time that I had to teach him to fight like and it would it would come across as apathy sometimes where I'd be like why don't you care um because he would just kind of shut down there's like you just shut down (laughs) yes there is it's like somebody has to teach the other person and he's taught me all kinds of important things too other things but yeah mm-hmm. other things but not how to fight that was the thing where it was like you're not going to be you're not going to be mean to me like you mm-hmm. can be snippy you can be grumpy maybe a little bit rude but you're never going to call me a name you're never going to like raise your voice in a scary way like yeah. you know right so well my therapist says it's conflict not combat combat yes. is what you're talking about if there's name right. calling whatever conflict we're good with yeah. combat yeah. no yeah yeah and so. with people pleasing you can, can can you can conflate the two where you're like yes and it's it's so interesting because we're talking about you know where do we find ourselves people please, pleasing and in my romantic relationships like i said i've always been like oh yeah you argue with the person you're most intimate with you argue about things and that's a safe space to do that but outside of that with friendships i'm like i would rather die <laughs> i like do not yeah. want to argue with my friends ever i do not want conflict it's so hard to do any kind of confrontation for me and i don't you know i'm still working on on understanding all of that but it's really interesting to have these like two characters who are kind of you know I don't know. It's like Harriet is both. She's like, she doesn't know how to argue with her romantic partner. And she also doesn't know how to have any sense of unrest between her and her friends. It's like everything needs to be smooth. I have to agree with you on every single thing you say. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's fascinating. Oh my gosh. My mind is just spinning. The, the, I know. The, the, the end piece being resolution or separate and tension. That is such right. a huge difference. Um, one of my, I have, my son when he was in kindergarten came home with like a mother's day they like make him fill out a mother's day thing and one of the things he wrote was that we always fight in my family but we always make up and and it's okay or something it was like the sweetest thing that's perfect but also i was like oh maybe like he really knows no (laughs) but but now i feel much better about it because yeah he's learning that it's not a bad thing to fight it's not an unsafe thing Yes, and that's right. you know oh, to exactly. disagree. It's not unsafe. I just got goosebumps. That's, I Thank like you. that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have to ask about one line real quick. I every once in a blue moon, Corinne knows this. There's a line in a book that stops me in my tracks, and I have to read it over a hundred times. And I think I know what it means, but I'm not sure. And I'm like, this was one of them. I haven't had one in a while. Yes, I had one with Rebecca true. Searle yes. that I still talk about. Yes. So I got to ask you about this one. Okay. Okay. Want want in italics Mm -hmm. is kind of a thief it's a door in your heart and once you know it's there you'll spend your life longing for whatever is behind it tell me about this line want is a thief 
please, please. Yeah. So to me, that's about the fact that when you're, again, when you're like a people pleaser, you get so used to not asking questions of yourself. And it can be really like, this is such a small example, but like, if you're one of multiple siblings and you know, you know, like everybody's going to want to go through a different drive through. And so ultimately what's going to happen is your, your parents are going to be like, we're choosing the drive through and you will, <laughs> you will live with it. And you know, if you're a person who doesn't want to rock the boat ever and wants to make everyone happy, then you try to not have your own opinions. A lot of times you try to be like, I'm fine with anything. I, you know, that's totally cool. I'll find something there. Mm -hmm. Like you're trying to require the least. And something happens sometimes where you stumble on something you didn't know you could want like you just something you didn't know about and it changes mm -hmm. you forever because you're like now I like am going to long for this thing that before mm -hmm. this I didn't even know existed and for Harriet that's you know what her love with Wynn is like she 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 thought she knew what kind of relationship she was sort of after based on what she didn't want <laughs> basically mm -hmm. and then once she has his love it's like that changes things forever and now every time that you know there's something and th this choice in front of her she's always going to be thinking about this other thing and she mm -hmm. doesn't think she can have that other thing and also the the idea of a door in your heart i feel like specifically when you meet a people new people who you love new when you fall in love with a person or a friend for the first time so much of it is it feels like it opens this new part of yourself and it's this yeah. feeling of expansion where you're like i'm different and i'm more than i thought i was i have this whole other space that, you know, I didn't know about. And this person has found a way to open it in me. And once you know that that exists, again, it's like hard to, to live without it. And it's sort of like, you'd rather just not, <laughs> no. rather not know. I guess it's yes. the opposite of the, it's better to have loved and lost is that line. <laughs> it's the polar yeah. opposite. Yes. Oh gosh, that's know. better than I could have ever even imagined your answer there. So I want to well, go with that. Um, kind of idea too because when and harry talk a lot about loving each other in other universes multiverses mm -hmm. that 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 their love is is more than just right here and right now um mm -hmm. and and some astrologers say that like whoever you meet in your life this is like a, a counterpoint something that has been carried on from before yeah. and i was just wondering if this is something you believe in multiverses universes love that that spans lifetimes i was just curious yeah. what you're thoughts are i think yeah. i do believe in multiverses i haven't read the, the most recent take on it but for a while there it seemed like enough scientists were saying yes this is the way that it works that i was like okay <laughs> i'm trusting you mm -hmm. um yeah <laughs> and i think i don't know i don't know i think like the one thing that's not quite multiverse but sort of tangential to that is i think a lot about time and mm -hmm the idea that based on what we know of physics, it's like time is just another coordinate. And with happy place, like part of, part of what I was doing with this place in Maine, like I was thinking about like, what are like, what are, you know, what are our happy places? And when you think about a physical place, it's usually connected to people and it's usually connected to a sort of significant time in your life or a significant thing that happened in an event. And the one that I always come back to is Lake Michigan, which is where I went to college. Mm -hmm. And I had so many uh, really important formative experiences there. And when I go back to Lake Michigan, I really do feel like I'm more me than I am in some, some other places just because I've been there at these different points in my life. Oh. And it feels like this compacting of time where it's like I'm here with all of these younger stupider yeah. <laughs> Emily's and then also yeah. with all of the Emily's that are, that are going to keep coming back to this oh. place and so I feel like more me and more grounded and more connected to everyone I've been and to wherever I'm going and I think that there are relationships that are like that too and like I've been with my partner since I was 18 years old so we've been together like it won't be that much longer until it's like we've been together longer more. than um we than worked not. and my yeah yeah and and my parents got together when they were 17 and or they got married when they were 17 and 19 and they're now um in their mid 60s and so they really 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 grew up together and 
that's not for everyone. And like, I feel like if I were a parent, I would be like, absolutely not. <laughs> like your brain is way yes. too soft, but yeah. it really worked in their case. Yeah. And so far it's really working in, <laughs> in our case. And it's this feeling that you got to be all of these different people with this one person and somehow all of them worked. And that's a miracle. Even in friendships, that's a miracle. When you have a friend yeah. who you've known and loved since you were 10 and you're like, we have nothing in common with who we were then except each other. That's so strange and miraculous feeling to me. It feels, it does feel like maybe not, maybe not faded, but just significant. It feels significant. It feels yeah. significant in all of time and space. And I think with like the idea of the multiverse, it's just like an extension of that where it's like, we've loved each other in all these different times. And, and so if, if time really is a coordinate, then we're still out there in all of those points. Like someone, like yes. we are still having yes. that experience elsewhere it's happening at this exact second every single moment we spent together is is also happening and oh God, i find a lot of comfort in that <laughs> yeah. um i find a lot of you know that's a, a way that i deal with grief too is just to think about the fact that like no that's still happening that you know every moment you've had with the person you love is still happening somewhere so i don't know i think the multiverse oh, is just like that. the more extreme version of that <laughs> Wow, that was really helpful yeah. for grief. But it's true. It's like literally true. Yes. That's like the thing yes. that's so weird about it. So like it's literally true. You still get to be out there right. having that moment right now. And yeah, you can't like hop into it so far. And maybe that's for the best. But that that version of you is there doing that. And I think, yeah, that's just so, so, so beautiful that oh, wow. love really cannot be ended or taken away no matter what. Oh my God, oh. love cannot be ended or taken away no matter what. Wow. Um, wow. My parents too, my parents met at, when they were 13 and 14 and married oh when they were 17 gosh. and 18 and they are still together 66 wow. uh, years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. amazing. And you're like, you're, yes. I, again, it's like, I know that's the exception. Would not be thrilled if I had less 17 year old daughters trying to get married. And they wouldn't be either. Like, I think that's one thing, like, even though my partner and I have been together for so, so long now, like we didn't get married for like, we still got married young, but like not, you know, there was, we've been through enough phases of life already to be like, somehow this is still working. <laughs> like we'll keep it's going. It's so amazing. Yeah. And Kate knows I say that all the time with my husband. I feel like we've had many different marriages in the same yeah. marriage. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so, and you know, that's something that I think people who, who get to have long marriages are always like, this is something really cool about it. It's something really frustrating sometimes and, and hard, but also something really cool that you can have one relationship that yeah. just, yeah, hits yeah. every, it's just everything. Got, it's every different thing. Yeah. And they've got oh. your number on it all. You're right. That it yes. can be a challenge too. They know it all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Wow, yeah. this is amazing. I we I I hate to come to a close because we don't want to come to a close, but we we will close with how we always close, which is to ask what you are loving. You know, maybe something Ooh. you're obsessed with, a TV show, book, yeah. podcast, oh. whatever or um, you might want to share of what you're yeah. currently obsessed with. Um, well, I'm like eagerly I I'm, I don't know when this aired, so I'm like was this what I was talking about last time we did this, but the last show that I was really obsessed with was Severance. And so I'm like yes, waiting for that Severance. to come back. And then actually, no, that was the second to last. The one after that, that I was obsessed with was Bad Sisters. And I feel like not enough people have watched oh, Bad Sisters yet. Bad oh, it's fantastic. Sisters. Oh, um, it's so, so good. good. Yeah. We have done that. Good. I'm yeah. glad to hear that fantastic. because I'm just and like, good stuff. What, something, something magic is happening in, in Ireland right now. There's all kinds of good stuff. Yes. Good at free yeah. actors <gasps> coming out of there. That's so yeah. true. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. And just That's breaking right. forms. I love that. I mean, I'd never seen yeah. something where kind of the same thing happens over and over with a different sister. It's, I won't, I don't want to spoil anything because yeah. I'm being a little vague. And it keeps you on so the edge. It's like yeah. sometimes yeah. when you're playing with form like that, it can just become taxing and you're like, I get it. <laughs> That's clever. But with this one, it's like, no. you, it's so compelling it all works. the way through. Oh, so good. Yeah. And we've never liked an opening theme song more than that. I don't know why. Yes, Usually I hit skip intro, but I it's sit so and listen good. every time. And the really long, like, so Rube Goldberg machine, like, going through. Yes. Yeah, so good. Exactly. Yes. So good. All right. Well, Emily, thank you. We can't wait to see some of your adaptations. I know there's quite a few in the works. <laughs> yes. yes. 
we will see. I'm excited about it. We just got to get um, studios to pay writers so we can <laughs> end the strike yes. and, and move Absolutely. forward. So if some studio exec is listening, do us all a, yes. a solid and pay your writers. Yes, of, some of the picket signs that people are sharing on social media are fantastic. And one of them was maybe make your character a little more likable. Yes. <laughs> yes. You studio oh exec. Yes. You're not likable. Right. Yes. Oh but hurry up because we need Emily Henry adaptations <laughs> on our TVs or screens immediately. So well, um, Emily, thank congratulations. You. Yes. Thank yes. you for joining us and, th and congratulations. Happy Place is uh, you're knocked it out of the park. So. Thank you so much. Thank we are screaming it from me. the rooftops, but apparently everyone's already listening. So <laughs> no, I think I think that you did it. I think that you kind of made it happen. So thank you so much for being part of that. And it's always Absolutely great not. to I'm talk to you. I'm cutting that out. <laughs> yeah, legally uh, speaking, I feel like my.